I'm looking there because it's I'm not up there, but I should be there. Hi, welcome to our 11 a.m. service this morning. My name is Rachel. Hi, my name is Martin. And we are part of the 11 a.m. team here that make the service happen. Any complaints? Send them to Martin. Yeah. Anything you love, bring them to me, basically. Okay. That's what we're saying. A bit mean. <laughs> so we're so glad that you're here. And if you're new, tuning in online, if you've not found us yet, but you found us today, we're so glad that you're here and hope you really enjoy watching from the comfort of your sofa or wherever you might be. And if you're in the building new, then you're so welcome as well. I just met some new people. It's lovely to meet you. Um, we're going to get our service going. How about you stand up to... Um, Indicate that you're listening to us, if you're able um, to stand. If not, stay seated. And then Marty is going to pray for us, and we're going to hand over to our amazing worship band to spend some time in worship. <laughs> Relatively amazing. Great. So before we worship, I just wanted to read something from um, Psalm 131. So this morning, we're starting a new series about um, mental health. Um, and I, I just wanted to read this psalm, because it's this really honest psalm. Um, where um, the psalmist goes from this place of sort of inner kind of turmoil and despair to a place of hope. And this morning, yeah, we're, we're going to worship God. We're going to pray for one another. We're going to hear from Claire. And we, we want to go in that direction of hope together as a community. So here we go. O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvellous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O oh Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and evermore. O oh Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and evermore. And we put our hope in you. Jesus, we want to go in that direction of hope together, wherever we are this morning, wherever we are in that journey, maybe in a place of difficulty or despair, maybe full of hope, but as a community, I pray that as we worship, as we dig into you today, that we'd know that you are our hope, Jesus. Amen. Amen. another verse. Where did that come from? No, go back to the other verse, young. Come on, let's give them what they pay for. The other one. Um, no, not that one, young. The other one. Yeah, that's the one. Have we done that one? And our hearts returning to you. Yeah, we turn to you. We turn is staring in your kingdom broken lives are made new <laughs> we love you when we see you when we see you we find strength to face the day in your presence all our fears are washed away 
I genuinely haven't got those other verses on my piece of paper. I knew we were in trouble when Rachel introduced us as the amazing worship team. I thought, oh no, that does not bode well. Well done, everyone. Thanks for carrying us through there. Now, um, guys, just want to let you know about um, growing up. Did any of you have any heroes when you grew up? I had a couple of heroes. I'm going to show you. My, this is my first hero. Um, do you, anyone know who that is? I'm a drummer when I was learning drums. That's Mike Borden from Faith No More. I saw him on top of the pops. I was like, I want to be him. I grew my hair long, played the drums. Yeah, it didn't go so well. Um, but the other one, Stevie G, there he is. Oh, me and Stevie, he's one of my heroes. Obviously, our football careers have gone in slightly different directions. Um, but yeah, I love my Stevie G. Now, have you, did any of you have any heroes? Maybe the person next to you, just for a moment. If you're online, you can post it in the chat. Who was your hero growing up? Did you have a hero? I want to be like them. Come on, be honest. All right, everyone, well done. Well done, you. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to have to just an honest moment. To be honest, I, I got good at playing the drums, but I was never as good as Mike Borden. I was never as good as him. And to be honest, I love playing football, but I, I never got as good as Steven Gerrard, believe it or not. Um, but actually, one of the heroes that we all have is Jesus, in that we look to someone, we want to be like them. But the best thing about having Jesus as our hero is Actually, we can become more like him every day. Actually, as we worship Jesus, as we spend time with Jesus, as we spend time with people loving Jesus, we get to be more like him. So we're going to sing a song saying how we can become more like Jesus. And we've got a very special guest, the wonderful Martin Riddle. Give him a big round of applause. One, a two, a one, two, three, four. To the top, but that ain't where it stops because he's coming back for me. Oh, he became human like I am and strolled right into town. He died, but then he rose again where death could keep him down. Is heaven's fire to vanquish the enemy? Well, show me the way to the Father, draw me into the light. I'll call you Lord, I won't ever be born because you are my soul's delight. Yay, Jesus, I want to be like you. I want to walk like you, talk like you. You're too kind. You're too kind. (laughs) 
Jürgen Klinsmann. Who's he? He's a Tottenham footballer. Ah. That was about as good as it's got, and about 20 years after that, we're still not really any further on. Not any so. further on. <laughs> no. Aww. What a hero, though. What a hero. Are you going to ask me who mine was? <laughs> Who's your hero, oh, Rachel? Oh, OK, who's my hero? <laughs> exactly. We haven't practised this. No, no. Um, I, I can't, can't tell. My hero, I actually Thanks. can't remember her name, but she was an international show jumper. OK. And, um, <laughs> she's a, and I used How's to that have, going? <laughs> yeah, that's not going very well either, actually, to be honest. But I used to have her posters on my wall, and I wanted, when I grew up, I wanted to be an international show jumper. And here we are. Still time. There's still time. <laughs> we, we, I want to be like Martin Riddle, actually, to be fair, after that turn on yeah. the harmonica. He has been practicing at home. Our ears are slightly ringing. Come on. <laughs> no, it's good. It's really good. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so, Marty. Yes. What Welcome. do you want to say? <laughs> if you've just joined our, this... Uh, Slightly rambly um, service this morning. Um, you're really welcome. So my name is Martin. I'm part of the 11 o'clock team here. We want to say a massive um, welcome to you um, if you're here in the room. And also, if you're joining us online, um, hello to you as well. So I think we're going to have a QR code going up on the screen, which is going to upstage what I'm about to say. So don't look at the QR code yet. <laughs> oh, oh, I can't help. It's really hard not to look. OK. Oh, there it is. <laughs> um, but um, we, we would really love at Woody's to help you to get involved. Um, if you are uh, new to the church or um, you're sort of looking to get more involved, we'd really love to help you do that. So as I was on my way to um, church this morning, I just I had this sense, and I don't know whether this is like a God sense or just me, but if you have tried to kind of get involved in church maybe over the last 18 months or so, I just want to like encourage you, maybe just like give it another try. We'd love to help you find a place to belong here. So um, I'm part of a midweek group um, with some friends uh, in St. Werbergs, and I'm so grateful for them. Those guys really helped me to feel like I belong here at the church. They pray for me. We have a meal together. We meet up every other week and just sort of encourage one another. So that's what we'd love to do. So it doesn't commit you to anything if you click on our QR code or you take a photo of it or whatever you're supposed to do. Um, <laughs> Martin. Uh, I think you're, you're allowed to get your phone out in church for this. Yeah, bit. That's totally the only allowed. Time. Um, but um, yeah, we'd love to help you get involved. So yeah, if you're if you're sort of like a little bit on the edge and you and you want to know a little bit more about Woody's, um, that is for you. Has it actually appeared? It was yet? there. It, it was, was there. there. I looked. I'm sorry. I couldn't. Okay. I couldn't help. Right. It. It's like I just tried really hard, but I just had to Can't see. Can't believe it. Um, and also, if you are here and you want to connect with us right now today in the building and on you on the way out, there will be somebody wearing a. Uh, Newcomers T-shirt. It'll be mustard, mustard-coloured T-shirt. Pumpkin. Pumpkin colour. colour. Sort of. Pumpkin. Butternut squash. Out there on the on the desk. Go see them. They will um, have a chat with you and just help you con connect. And you can find out more about us. Ask some questions. So do, do visit them on the way out. And and to help with a bit of connection because it is quite hard, isn't it? Coming out of the pandemic, we are having an 11 a.m. lunch. <laughs> that was. Can we do that again? 11 a.m. lunch. Excellent, we're getting there. And uh, that's going to be on March the 6th, two days before my birthday, just thought I'd drop that in. Yeah. And we're going to have it after the 11 a.m. service. We're going to go to the upper hall. We're going to have a uh, yummy lunch and just an opportunity to kind of get to know each other, hang out, have a bit of a chat. So do put that in your diaries. Come along, it's going to be lush. Awesome. OK, so um, I think I'm going to welcome up Laura and Joe. going to tell us a little bit about Children's Church and Devo. Thanks, Marty. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, if it has passed your notice, tomorrow is Valentine's Day. I'm very excited about it. But if you're wondering what love language actually your child speaks, there's five different kind of love languages. We've got a little helpful flyer for you in the foyer just to think about whether it's words of affirmation or gifts or quality time and different ways that we can just express our love to people. I really like gifts. So I just want to put that out there in case you want to buy me one. Um, but this morning in our children's church and across the month of February, we're thinking about how we can be friends with Jesus and we're helping um, the children to connect and become friends with each other as well. Um, and so upstairs this morning, we're going to have Bright Explorers. And in the crypt, we've got Tiny Treasures. And we've also got Football Church over at the Sports Hall. And they will come back to the foyer at quarter past 12. And but very excitingly, we've got an advert out at the moment for a sports minister. So if you or someone you know might be interested in mentoring and getting alongside and playing football um, with uh, young children, then we would really love to hear from you. And you can find out more on our website. Thanks. Hello everyone, uh, Devo is our youth group for teenagers, so if you're a teenager you're very welcome to join us. 
Uh, and this morning we are jumping back into our storylines um, kind of series where we look at some themes in the Bible uh, and discover what they might mean for us today. And there's a salvation storyline. So that's Ooh, Is that a real person? A, a person's coming to share their story? No, no. that's oh. Story Sunday. Ah, oh, wrong there's one. Storyline Scripture Sunday uh. and there's Story Sunday. Oh, it sounds Very good. Sounds good. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. Joe and Laura are amazing children's and youth ministers. Thank you so much for all you do and your teams. You're just brilliant. We're so thankful for you. Now it's time for the young people and the kids to go out. I'm going to pray for you before you go. God, we ask for a blessing on all that is going to take place today with our young people and our children. May they just really connect with you in some way today and bless our volunteers as they lead them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you're not sure where your children are going to go as well, do go and find somebody in a green t-shirt in the foyer and they will be able to tell you. For the rest of us, why don't you just turn to somebody who's near you and ask them who their childhood hero was. Yeah, who was your childhood hero? Share it amongst just yourselves. <laughs> Oh, right, yeah, no, what yeah, now? Yeah. yeah, yeah, cool. Is he here? Yeah, I've seen him. All right. All right. Oh, okay, cool. All right. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Lots of, uh, lots of heroes. So I'm going to welcome up, speaking of heroes, we're going to welcome up Tim Dobson. Is Tom, Tim Dobson around anywhere? Is Tim? Oh, sorry, Tim. Looks like we haven't given him enough warning. Do you want to, do you want to tell us a bit about the workplace conference? Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> That's okay. Sorry, no, I've, I've got my brother here from Peru, and the, the whole weekend's been taken up with looking after things. So, um, yes exciting thing coming up is there's going to be a workplace conference. Now, um, we come to church on Sundays, and when we're here, uh, hopefully you feel inspired by people who use their gifts and abilities, whether it's leading worship, looking after children, young people. Um, but actually, for most Christians, uh, church isn't where you get the chance to be a Christian and to use your skills and gifts. Actually, the workplace is the place where uh, you get to do that. Um, so, and we as church believe that we want to equip you uh, the best we can to uh, live for God's kingdom in the workplace. So on Saturday the 5th of, of March, so that's in three week weekends time, uh, we're going to spend a morning from 9.30 till 1, just looking at what does it mean for God's kingdom uh, to uh, break out in our workplace. And Cheryl, who's there? Do you want to give us a wave? Um, uh, Cheryl's going to do a little kind of panel. We're going to uh, we're going to think about the kingdom of heaven, uh, what it looks like. So we've got some people from the workplace who are going to be here giving their own stories about the workplace. We've got some input. We've got some seminar breakout rooms, uh, looking at things, intriguing things like in the workplace, are you a thermometer or a thermostat? Oh, that's deep. Do you measure the temperature or do you set the temperature? Oh, yes. So, kind of workplace conference, go on the website. Um, it's five pounds to book in. We've got a little goodie bag to give you with some resources as well. Uh, so, it should be a fantastic morning. We hope you can join us. Uh, for anybody in any kind of workplace, uh, you'll be really welcome. Uh, but do ask Cheryl and myself uh, if you'd like some more details. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. Well, we put you on the spot there. 
<laughs> that was Great. brilliant. That's impressive. We're going to take up an offering now. Now, here at Woody's, we don't have an offering bucket that goes around every week, or most of us give by standing order or direct debit, but once a month, we like to take a kind of an extra offering to bless either our global partners, who are the people who are serving God around the world, or our local mission partners, people and organizations that are serving the city of Bristol and the surrounding areas. And this week is Local Partner Sunday, which means that the offering that we take this morning is going to go and bless many of the charities that Woodlands are, is connected to around the city. And each month we do this, we like to try and focus in on one, but this is not, it doesn't mean all the money is going to go to that particular charity, but it means it's going to go to all of them, but actually some of it will go to this charity. And the charity we're focusing on this morning is Home for Good. It's a brilliant Christian charity that supports um, adoption and fostering and vulnerable children and it, it's around the UK it was started actually by a friend of mine so I'm pretty passionate about it a guy called Chris Kandaya and uh, Kat Gray who is part of our 915 um, congregation is uh, a champion of Home for Good and actually works with them to really um, yeah highlight the area of vulnerable children in our city and it's going to have a little slide going to come up and it's just got some interesting provoking challenging stirring facts just about the situation in our city at the moment the number of children in care has gone up dramatically over the last few months and lockdown has not helped at all in fact it's made things a lot worse there has been a really big influx of teenagers who have been taken into care and often teenagers are really difficult to place into foster homes they often come with complex needs and that, that can be really challenging children who wait the longest are sibling groups older children and children with additional or medical needs. Because as you can imagine, it's a really challenging situation to absorb a, a challenging child, but obviously a child that needs more love and more support and more care, but often they are the ones that wait the longest to be um, fostered. And uh, also we need specialist foster carers for unaccompanied asylum seeker children, children that have come into the UK. Um, you know, they're under 18 and sometimes, really, you know, they don't know that they are, but they realise that they are and they need to be in really sort of specialist situations to look after them. So the, the climate at the moment in the city is, is tough, it's hard, but there are also wonderful stories, even in this congregation, in, in our church, of incredible families who have adopted and fostered and are looking after vulnerable children. So we're so thankful for you guys that do that. So if you'd like to give an offering towards any of our local partners, then we're going to have an opportunity to do that. There are some card machines. There's one there to my left. There's one at the back on my right. There's also um, a slide that's going to come up which tells you how you can go onto our website and you can go onto our giving page and just give an, um, an offering on that. You can also do a text code, which text 11 Woody to 70085, and that is a, a £10 gift. There's loads of really easy ways to give. If you're new and, um, you know, we don't want anyone to feel under any pressure or sense of compulsion to give at all, our giving is actually an act of worship, it's actually an offering. So if you want to give, then give. If, you, if you're not able to, then that's really okay too. And Marty is going to pray for Home for Good, especially, and then I'm just going to pray for the world at the moment because there's some big stuff in the news to pray for. Yeah, Heavenly Father, we, um, we thank you um, for the work of Home for Good. And um, we just thank you for the support that they're, that they're giving. I thank you that they have a voice even in the government to uh, sort of lobby. Um, yeah, we just, we pray for, for Chris Kandai as he leads that organization just so well and just advocates um, for vulnerable children all over our nation. And God, we, we, we ultimately believe that where, where kids are crying out and they're not heard, God, that you hear. And so we just, we just pray that you would mobilize support and that you would put just really great people in place um, for those children, for those young people, for those uh, unaccompanied asylum seekers, Lord God. We just, yeah, as we give, Lord, we just, yeah, we just give with, with that prayer and just with that hope that, that it's not just sort of human giving, but it's actually something that you're behind because that's what you're about. Amen. And God, we pray for our world at the moment, and we particularly pray for the situation in the Ukraine. And our, you know, our hearts and our minds were on tender hooks to see what is going to happen in the coming days in that place. And we just ask, Lord God, for intervention. We thank you for the diplomatic efforts that are taking place 
to try and sort of hold back what is going on. And we just ask you, God, to do what only you can do and to avert this crisis, to avert this um, potential war to break out. We ask, Lord God, for men and women of peace to rise up and to just be able to say the right words at the right time in the right way. We ask you, God, to just hold it back. We, we just are desperate to not see another conflict just spill out into, the, into, the, into Europe. And we just ask you, God, to hold it back. We ask, Lord God, for the impossible, for, for Russian troops to sort of return, to sort of sink away. We ask, God, that, that men and women would be, would be safe, the children, the vulnerable, which we know that war always affects so much more than, than others. We just ask, Lord God, that your hand would be over that nation, your hand would be over the Ukraine, that you would be at work in the authorities and the leaders. We pray for Putin, God. We just pray that you would affect his heart and his mind and that this crisis would be averted. And we ask that in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Let's stand together. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time in worship before Claire comes and launches our new sermon series.
Yes, Father, our, our hope is in you. Thank you that there's such substance to our hope. Thank you that our hope is in the love and the power of Jesus. From wherever, wherever we're at this morning, whether it's just holding on for dear life to that hope or whether it feels really near to us, yeah, we just thank you that, that's, that that is who you are. You are our hope. You're a firm foundation for us, God. Amen. Amen. Great. Take a seat for us. So we're just going to watch an intro video to our uh, new sermon series before Claire comes to speak to us. I'm angry, I'm depressed, I'm anxious. And it's really weird, like, I just don't want to do anything. You're thinking about quitting, you're thinking about getting up. God doesn't want us to worry about our future and depend on ourselves to make things right. He wants us to depend on Him. God wants you to turn to Him no matter the point in life. He wants to help you when you are struggling. I'm angry, I'm depressed, I'm anxious. Filmmaker Dan makes these um, intro videos. They're so helpful just to set up the ideas that we're going to be talking about. So we are into a mental health series. So for three weeks, we're going to look at mental health. Not a small topic. <laughs> so um, at eight o'clock, I spoke at the eight o'clock service. You get 10 minutes to speak on mental health. There's a world mental health crisis the World Health Organization said a few years ago that every country in the globe has got a mental health crisis going on. So 10 minutes, not very long. 20 minutes, 25 if I'm pushing it. Um, <clears throat> we, we, all we're going to do is we, we're going to just raise a few thoughts and questions about how do we look at mental health in the world that we're living in at the moment, post-pandemic, which is an added complication on top of what was already a crisis. And I think, you know, if you think right now, who do you know who has been struggling? It may be that it's you, or it may be that there are people, I'm sure every person in this room will know someone who has really struggled in the last few months during COVID. Apparently 50% of people um, are reporting severely increased distress, mental distress. One in four people have mental health issues at any one time. One in five people are, are reporting suicidal thoughts. We are in a crisis in the world. And one of the things that we wanted to do over the next few weeks is just go there and try and work out what our posture as church is to be like in a situation like this and how, what, what can we do and what is God saying to us at this time? If you have been tracking with the Whole Minds website, our new website, which we've been developing over the last few months that is looking at mental health issues, you'll, you might have seen a story recently. There's a whole stream of stories of people who have walked that hard journey of grappling with mental health and trying to find freedom and breakthrough. And the most recent story is of a woman who herself was a mental health practitioner and who for, until she was in her 60s or begin, just at the end of her 50s, she was working, she'd worked as a nurse and a social worker and become an expert really in her field of mental health. And yet she tells on this story that I'll read a little bit of later on um, how behind the scenes the picture was completely different and while on the surface of things it looked like she knew what to say and what to do with people who were struggling in her own life it was a battle it was an absolute battlefield and she struggled with feelings of darkness and and low self-esteem and these kind of awful kind of internal thought processes that would drag her down into the darkness it was a very bleak picture and for many of us 
we have learned how to put a bit of a face on. And I know that there are people in the room today who are really struggling. And maybe it doesn't look like that on the, on the surface of things. But to people who know you well and you yourself know, it's looking pretty dark on the inside. And I don't know where to go and what to do with it. And we want to sort of look at, look at this over the next few weeks and see what we can do. Now, one of the things that reality is about being a Christian is that sometimes the church hasn't done a very good job with this issue. <laughs> There's something about the tension between being somebody who is supposed to have hope and peace and joy, because we do believe that that is what Jesus brings into people's lives. And we've seen it over and over again, the stories of people's lives being transformed and hope growing and peace finally coming into people's lives and so you feel a bit of a commitment to the story your commitment to Jesus the story of how Jesus changes lives but if you start to struggle sometimes you can feel a bit like oh am I a bad advert for this thing is this um you know is am I some kind of substandard Christian if I struggle should I show it because it lets the side down and sometimes churches can be places where the tension becomes a little bit unbearable, even though the Bible is absolutely open about the struggles that human beings have. And some of its greatest heroes have struggled greatly. So let's have a just um, a read of Psalm 38, which is a couple of slides down. Here, this is Psalm 38. Now, this is a picture of somebody who is struggling. These Psalms are ancient prayers that are written by the greats of the Bible. And this person says, All my longings lie open before you, O Lord. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart pounds. My strength fails me. Even the light has gone from my eyes. My friends and companions avoid me because of my wounds, and my neighbors stay far away. I become like a man who does not hear, whose mouth can offer no reply. I wait for you, O Lord. You will answer, Lord my God. That's someone who is in the heart of depression and struggle, who is expressing to God the reality of the bleakness that that person is sensing inside. And I just want to say today that we recognize that this is a battleground. It is a battleground for all human beings. It is a battleground for you and for me to stay healthy on the inside to stay real and to stay able to access the hope and peace of God. Many of you in this church will, will remember Margie, who was one of my closest friends and dearly loved as a person in this church and as sister to Al, who's part of this congregation, wife to Adrian. And many of us were friends with Margie, but 11 years ago, she took her life after a long battle with mental illness. It was so hard to walk the, that path and for it to end there. And one of the things that Margie would struggle with is anxiety, this terrible anxiety that would gnaw away at her. And she, would, uh, she was a person of faith. She loved Jesus. And every now and again, she'd come up from above the storm that she was in and she would declare her love for Jesus, her hope and her peace in Jesus. And sometimes she would write Bible verses on post-it notes and stick it all around the house. And her husband Adrian said to me once he dreaded the arrival of the post-it notes because it kind of heralded this onslaught of anxiety that she was drowning in. And in the end, she took her life. She, she lost the battle. And we just want to say today that, you know, we have some amazing stories of winning that battle. But there are, the reality is, is we live in a tension and in a world that can get very dark and desperate for some people. And we have chosen to hang in there and to believe that there is a greater story for every life. I believe that Margie is with Jesus. I believe that the last word was not death in her life, but life. And that God has the final word. And that the greater picture for all human beings, however hard the struggle is now, is that there is a God has the final word and he speaks peace and hope over our futures. So that's where we're at. We're in a tension, aren't we? And we just want to be able to be real about it. Um, <clears throat> and actually, the one, what we're going to do is we're going to go read something from the Old Testament about Elijah. Now, if you are familiar at all with the story of Elijah, he's one of the big 
you know, honchos of the Old Testament. He was a miracle working, confrontational, high performing whistleblower to the powers of his day. And he really annoyed King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. In fact, King Ahab called him, when he met him on the road one day, he called him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? And so he had a high profile and he was a high performing guy. But when we meet him in this story, he has had enough. So I just want to say before we read this story, three things. One is, it's not just weak people that struggle with mental health issues. You know, Elijah was not a weak person. He really was a very strong, powerful, accomplished person. But he came to the end of himself. Jesus was not a weak person when he said in Gethsemane, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. Paul, the apostle, not a weak person when he said, in my heart I feel a sentence of death. This is not about weakness. It's about our humanity and about the tension and the battleground we live in. Second thing is that life is complicated and so are you. Oh, yes, you are. <clears throat> you have arrived at this point in your life through all manner of twists and turns and it's all had an effect on you and your story is complex. Every week I meet with people for prayer to look at the things that they're grappling with and there's always a history. You have a history and your history will to many, in many ways determine how you tackle life and all its stresses. Third thing is that sometimes circumstances go spiral out beyond our control how with the best will in the world however amazing we are sometimes life just turns things up and it can flip people into really pressured places mentally so let's just bear that in mind as we go in and we meet Elijah at his lowest moment he's had a breakdown and he's had enough and here he is <clears throat> Elijah's story, 1 Kings 19, after Elijah had executed the prophets of Baal. So, you know, he has this big showdown. Queen Jezebel's prophets are um, kind of ruling the show in Israel. But Elijah proves to them that God is God with this supernatural fire. Go read the story. But basically, after this, Jezebel is so angry. And she says, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them, her priests. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went on a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he, may die, he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. <clears throat> All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him there. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. <clears throat> the Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. <clears throat> then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left and now they're trying to kill me too. 
Go back the way you came. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha to succeed you as prophet. I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal and whose mouths have not kicked, kissed him. Kicked him, kissed him. <clears throat> it's a, an amazing story. And it is an insightful story about God and about humans and about high-performing individuals who have reached the end of their tethers. And the thing that is most striking to me is the tenderness of God when it meets our hum human frailty. Do you understand that, first of all, that God is tender towards you in your frailty, in your weakness, in times of failure, when you have reached the end of your tether, he is not cracking the whip. And I don't think we really believe that. Honestly, I think many of us carry this sort of sense that somehow God is driving the thing, driving us to perform better. And we want to perform for him. We want to perform in our lives because we get our self-esteem from performing well and from the praise that comes back and the good feedback, and we muddle it all up, and we think that God is like that too, and he wants to get this job done and the gospel spread, and we're kind of in the way because we're irritatingly slow and unable to really manage ourselves. So is that the view that you have of God? Because what happens here is God comes and he does some by-the-book mental health care. He says, have a sleep. And he gives him quite a few weeks to just sleep. Get your sleep sorted. Eat this nice bread that I've cooked for you by the fire. Drink. Recuperate. If you go on all the mental health websites everywhere, it's the first port of call is eat well, sleep well, go outside. God is interested in your body and your physical welfare. And it is tied to your mental welfare. And God knows that. Listen to this description of what happens to your brain when you sleep. I thought this was like a little poem written by a scientist. <clears throat> In deep sleep, slow waves of cerebrospinal fluid, a clear watery liquid, literally washes over the brain, restoring order and calm in the neural pathways. God has made us as physical beings to need restoration and peace and sleep. And so that is part of the way that we learn to care for ourselves is to actually be able to take time off, not to think, oh, I'm the center of everything and I can't stop for anything, but actually to be able to get off the merry-go-round and listen to the good advice. Find a way of sorting your sleep out. So if you're somebody here today who's a bit in the grip of the struggle, then that will be the advice that you will be being given to try and get some order into your days, into your diet, into getting outside. Again, it's proven to just be outside. God has wired us to be connected to, the, to his creation order, to be restored by the things that he has made for us. So natural recovery is inbuilt into human beings. And we need to pay attention to that. And that is what God is saying. So if you're somebody who thinks, oh, I don't know if I can stop. I'm, you know, I've got all these things I've got to do. Well, you've got it from the top. You can stop. But actually what God does is he leads. He doesn't just lead Elijah into a place of sleep and rest. He leads him further and deeper. And I just want to go there for a few minutes. So, so God speaks to Elijah and he, 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 asks him he, he ends up in this cave it's on the mountain of Horeb which is the mount is Mount Sinai it's the place where the Israelite nation really gets its identity through a covenant that God makes with them where he says you're going to be my chosen people it's deeply symbolic for Elijah to be there on this mountain back to the beginning almost unraveling who am I in the context of all of these things that have happened I'm I'm part of your nation. I'm part of your chosen people. And so he goes there and he hides in a cave, of course, because that's what you do when you're unraveled. You hide in a cave, don't you? And he retreats into this cave and he waits to see what will happen. 
And God speaks to him and he says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah says, well, this is the bad news. I've been so zealous. I've been defending your name. And now everyone's against me. They're trying to kill me too. There's no one left. I'm totally alone. He is, at this point, he's at the, he is having a mental breakdown, really. That's what it looks like. And so often, in the cave of a mental breakdown or in the cave of mental pressure, we retreat into these places where our thoughts spiral down and round and round and round. I know some of you know what I'm talking about. A th- a something that somebody said to you or a perceived failure, something you've done, something you can't forgive yourself for, something someone won't forgive you for. They stay in there and they stick, don't they? Psychologists say that we have a negativity bias. We remember negative things more easily than positive. We remember trauma more easily than blessing. We remember criticism more than praise. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? If somebody criticizes you, oh, how it lingers, doesn't it? We're biased towards that. Our brains are biased to hold on to those things more than the positive things. And in the cave, that's what happens. What's your cave like? What does it look like for you? Awake in the night? Negative thinking spiraling round? Is your cave performance at work so you can't get off the treadmill? Your relationships? Your inability to connect? Your addictions? Your obsessions? What is it like? Because we're all in the boat together. We're all in the cave, actually. And we all retreat every now and again. But God speaks to Elijah and he says, what are you doing here? And Elijah gives him the bad news. And then God says, I'm going to pass in front of you. So just come out of the cave and wait. And the story recounts this experience that Elijah has where a storm passes by and fire passes by and an earthquake happens and God is not in any of them, these storms that are passing by the face of the cave. But suddenly, at the end of this dramatic uh, event, there's this still, small voice, a little whisper, and Elijah recognizes it. And he comes and he stands at the face of the cave and he has an encounter with God. So my question to us is, I think this is God training Elijah And it's a very important lesson because we're wired to hear the sound of the storms, like I just said. We're really wired for them. And if Elijah had not been attuned enough in that moment to hear the whisper, then he would have stayed in that cave and the storm, all he would have heard was storms without the presence. The storm, the earthquake without the presence, the fire without the presence. And, but actually, he hears this little voice, which is the presence of God. And I suppose, you know, there's a challenge for us here, because in, the, in mental health struggles and pressures, it is hard to hear the voice, isn't it? One of our jobs as church is to help people hear the voice if they can't hear it. One of our jobs as people who want to be prophetic is to listen for other people. Maybe you're called to increase your prophetic listening and be able to help people to hear the voice of God when they've lost sight of it. And there will be times when people really lose sight. And can we as a church stay in there and hang in there? And it is painful walking with a friend who is deeply depressed. It's painful having a family member who's deeply depressed. You know what I'm talking about. But for some people, they need you to be there to hear their voice. And often people struggle to walk alongside people with mental health p- issues because, and it's, because it's hard. And we worry we won't be enough. We worry that if we mention suicide, like I just did, that we'll somehow trigger something, even though all the advice by mental health professionals is that talking about it, even without solutions, helps to alleviate some of the pressure and actually takes people in the opposite direction. So we, we do worry that we'll not be enough. But can we rise to the call? And actually, people with mental health struggles, they know you can't solve it. They're not expecting you to. But if you are there with them in the struggle, it's huge. And so, Elijah has this moment with God, and it's a quiet moment. And one of the things we've got to learn to do is still 
our minds in order to hear. And I think probably that is one of the greatest battles of our age is how to still our minds in order to be able to hear the voice of God. It's not just about mental health, actually. It's about the culture we live in and the number of voices and distractions that we live in as probably the most complex that has ever been in human history. But the challenge is, is that God will speak to us, often in the quietness, if we can calm our minds, dial down enough to hear and so the beginning of mental health and wellness is that sense of the presence of God. It is to actually tune into, to learn how to tune into God. And God says to Elijah, what are you doing here? It's such a good question. We ask it on wholeness all the time. How did you get here? What are you doing? How is it going for you now? What are you doing in the situation you're in? And he goes on to say in a little bit, go back the way you came. It's such a wholeness question. It's how did you get here? What was the route that you got here from? And one of the things that we're committed to in this church is that it, it's a journey of wholeness. And every single person who is a follower of Jesus is on a journey of wholeness, is drawn into that understanding ourselves in a deeper way, understanding what has gone into make us the person that we are today. How does our mind work? How is it that God has created us? And actually, in, in a couple of weeks' time, we're going to be starting the wholeness course. And I'm inviting you, all of you, to come. And if you all come, we'll be struggling to pray with all of you. <laughs> but I want you to come. Because if you, if, if you come, you will see that there's somewhere to go with this stuff. It's not just that we're static and stuck. There is somewhere to go that the voice of God can speak into the pain and the struggle and he will take us step by step towards wholeness and that is what God is doing with Elijah and after this encounter that has started that process he asks him again what are you doing here Elijah and Elijah's disappointing answer he just repeats himself he's just had this huge encounter with God <laughs> with all the earthquakes and the fire and all that sort of thing and then God says to him what are you doing here was God hoping you'd say, well, actually, I'm in awe of you now and I'm recharged? Elijah just repeats the same thing. It's a nightmare, God. I've been trying to defend your name and I'm all alone and they want to kill me. And as I was reading that, I just thought, actually, all he did was he just spoke the truth because nothing had changed. The external circumstances of Elijah's life were exactly the same as they were before he went into the cave and he met with God. And that is a message of great hope, isn't it? Because God is training Elijah to think differently about his life. I often say to people, nothing or no one, no one else has to change in order for me to be free. God has made a way for kingdom people to interact with him, to be filled with his Holy Spirit, and to be healed and made whole, even when the circumstances are dire. And history is full of people who have lived in the most horrendous situations and really suffered and struggled, but there's this glowing heart in their life of their encounter with Jesus that has sustained them. And one day, when all of this is done, those stories will be the, the stories of quiet people who have met with God and known God even in times of intense struggle and held on to their hope and peace. And so Elijah, actually what happens is he's sent right back <laughs> into the fray, right back. And we hear his story unraveling and unfolding, sorry, over the next few chapters. And he, he's back there doing the miracles telling Ahaz what an evil king he is. He's right back there. And he, he actually, in the end, he, his life ends when God decides his life is going to end, not when evil Jezebel does. And he, God says to him, I'm giving you a legacy. In fact, you think you're alone. You're not alone. There's 7,000 people who are just like you. He's doing something that master psychologists do or therapists do. They reframe the situation for people, they say, you can see this differently. You know, the situation may be as it is, but you are a powerful person. 
You can access peace. You can be healed. You can unravel some of the mess that has accumulated in your life and you can start again. There's forgiveness, there's healing, there's wholeness. And so God really is saying to Elisha, everything is still the same, yes, but so is the God of Israel the same. So is his peace the same. His promise still stands. You haven't disqualified yourself by being weak and vulnerable mentally. Actually, you're called to be a kingdom person, a God's person. His promise stands in your life. And nothing has been demolished. Paul the Apostle said, we've got to demolish things that set themselves up against the knowledge of God and take captive thoughts, make them obedient to Christ. Not demolish the world around us to make it okay for us to thrive, but actually recognize that we can think well as kingdom people and whole as kingdom people. And so as we come out of the pandemic, I actually think there's a call for the church to be an example of what it looks like to have peace in a storm. You know, maybe you were supposed to tame a few storms too, but you can't tame a storm until you've got peace. Jesus had so much peace he could sleep in a storm. When he's roused by the disciples in that story of the storm on the lake, he stands up and he just releases what is in him. He just says, peace be still. So the fight right now is for each of us to find that peace. And we need to help each other. You may be called to walk someone through their struggle with their mental health. And I, I just want to bless you in that and bless your prophetic gifting so that you can hear the voice of God for other people. And I just want to point you to some resources, actually. One is wholeness, which starts on the 1st of March, that you can come with someone. If you are supporting someone and they're scared to come or it's too overwhelming, say, I'll come with you. I'll sit next to you. I'll pray with you. I'll walk you through the course. You know, it doesn't solve everything, but it moves people every year. A hundred people did it last year. They moved along that journey towards healing and wholeness. We've also got our new Whole Minds website, which has the stories and the articles about mental health. We're building it, and it's still in process, but um, do go and look at it. The other thing is there's a very good book by Peter Scatzero called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, Go and read it. Get it. Just get on this journey. I'm going to finish by reading a little bit of an excerpt from the story I mentioned at the beginning of the person who, who has on the surface of things all together, but underneath this sort of deep darkness that really had pulled her down all her life, to the, taking her also to the edge of wanting to end her life and then pulling back. And, and um, it, was a, it was a hard story if you read it. But she says this. I never would have imagined that over at what happens with her as she meets somebody at, at work actually offered to pray for her. She didn't know God. She knew nothing about church or spirituality. And she said, well, it can't hurt. And they, they just started a friendship and she ended up going to Alpha, doing wholeness. And this is her story. I'd never imagined that over a period of 18 months, such changes could happen. I felt thankful and began to feel that something or someone was finally offering me a different life. I felt that God was pursuing me and wasn't going to give up, even though I found it difficult at times to respond to the invitation. He is unfailingly persistent, that's for sure. And with this persistence, I am building faith and an understanding that it's possible to receive unconditional love. I now believe I'm seen. I'm lovable. God has taken 60 years to show himself to me. I'm grateful. I'm still defended in my heart at times, unsure at other times. But what I do know is that I am a different person to the one I have been the whole of my life. And this is joyful. And that is where we land. We land in the tension of that beautiful story of restoration and the pain of standing with people who are suffering, who don't always win that battle. But that is where we're at. As a church, we want to be able to walk with people through that journey, and we want to walk with you wherever you're at today. So I'm just going to invite you to pray, um, and just take a little moment and think, well, it may be that what's first on your mind is someone that is really suffering, that you are supporting. 
but it may be that you today are really struggling and this is pushing buttons and you're not quite sure where to turn. But why don't you just sort of in a way recognize that cave that we can be in. And I'm just going to ask that the still small voice of God will speak to you in the quiet for a minute or two. So dear God, we just sit before you now. We're, we're frail humans, aren't we? But you are tender-hearted towards us. You're full of mercy and you, you understand us, you get us. And I pray now that your Holy Spirit would come to us in whatever cave we find ourselves in and that you would challenge those negative voices that call us down into the darkness with the quiet, still voice of peace. And I just, I just say to your minds, in the name of Jesus, receive his peace today. Receive his peace. Jesus says over your mind, peace, be still. Peace, be still. Grow in peace. I pray, God, that you take us on a journey of unraveling how we got here for some of us. I did feel when I was preparing this that there, there might be someone who's been a bit of a whistleblower or a challenger at work. It was that really that you're somebody who challenges the powers and you've received a backlash and it's been really painful and it's taken its toll on your mental health. And I just feel like God, God wants to minister to you today. He wants to bring some healing. He wants to speak into that place and he doesn't want you to get off and just not be that person anymore. He wants to affirm you, but heal you. So I just, yeah, I speak peace to you. And I think um, Rachel is also, Rachel's going to come up and we'll, we'll go back into worship. If you feel like this has touched anything for you that is a live issue and you'd like some prayer, then there's a few people up at the front here who can pray with you. And I just want to remind you that wholeness is coming on the 1st of March. And that is a really good place to kind of just pitch for and say, right, I'm going to do some stuff. I'm going to do a bit of a spring clean in my life and my mental health this year. Thank you. Thanks, Claire, so much for your wisdom and your passion to help us keep sort of moving forward and growing. And Nigel and I were just chatting um, during Claire's sermon, helpfully chatting, not rude chatting. And um, we were saying at the beginning of the service, we were celebrating, we had the mouth organ and we had the, the fun songs. And at the end of the service, we're sort of, you know, really looking in on the hard stuff in life. And I think, you know, the, the Christian life is that. Let's just be honest about it. And, and it says in Romans, the Apostle Paul says, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. And as a community, that's what we want. We want to be real and authentic and to be able to you know, rejoice when there are things to rejoice about, but also be honest about the hard stuff in life and know that God is with us in those hard moments, those hard things in the pits, in the caves. His spirit is there. So thank you so much, Claire, for really reminding us of that. And I just got a little bit of family news that I wanted to share with some of you and um, well, all of you. But some of you will know Chris and Nell Fox, who were part of our church uh, a few years ago. And Nell has had um, a bit of a long journey with cancer and she passed away yesterday. So I'm just going to pray for Chris and their lovely daughter, um, Lily, who they adopted. God, we pray for Chris and Lily and Nell's family and the, and the wider church family that they're part of, we ask you, God, to be near, to be their comfort as they walk this really sad, difficult journey. And we thank you that Nell is with you, that death has not had the final word over her life. And we thank you that she's with you now. And we just pray for your mercy over that family. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to go back into some worship just to conclude our service, but we're not kind of rushing to end. And if you would like some prayer about anything, it may just be that you've come with a need that you really want to get some prayer for, a need for healing, or you're just carrying something and you think, yeah, I just need to say that to somebody and get them to pray for me. Then we would love to just you to make the most of this opportunity. And if you come to my left down here, 
then uh, yeah, I'll be there. A few of us will pray for you and just bless you. So let's stand together while we worship. And it's a good time to come now um, if you'd like some prayer. just wanted to share with you something as um, I was listening to Claire talk. I think um, maybe for us as a community of God's people, the first thing is just to, we have permission. We have permission to share how we're doing. We don't come to church just to tell everyone we're fine. But we have permission to say, actually, I'm not doing so good at the moment. And that this is a place to, as we encounter God, to be real with one another as well but also that God loves you, no matter how struggling you're doing. It doesn't mean God's gonna less, love you less. Actually, God loves you, whether you're on top form or whether you're really, really struggling and in a dark place, then it doesn't change how much God loves you and is for you. So yeah, I, I wanna just add my prayer to, for us, that as we look at this topic, even this month, that we'd have permission, God, to to be honest with you, to be honest with ourselves, to others of how we are. But I thank you, God, that your, your love covers us. Yeah, that wherever we feel we are, we are no less lovable by you. So God, we thank you for your 
constant presence and love for us. And yeah, I ask your, your blessing on us now. Actually, I'm just going to pray the peace. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. I think I might have just ended the service. Did I do that? I think I have, haven't I? I think we've ended. Guys, thanks so much for being with us today. It's lovely being with you. Do say hi to our team if you're new and wanting to connect. Do say hello to someone or go and grab your kids if you've got little ones here. Thanks for being with us, whether you're in the building or online, and we'll see you very soon. Bye.